Hello and welcome to the British Sitcom History Podcast. My name is Alan. With me, as always, is Gareth. Hello, Alan. <laughs> What's that? What was that voice? That was Piers Fletcher Dervish. <laughs> that was Piers Fletcher Dervish. Hmm. <laughs> I did my best. That was, that's that might be your worst one yet. <laughs> uh, yeah, a Piers Fletcher Dervish impression because today we are talking about the New Statesman. Uh, with Rick Mail as Alan Bastard. We're going back to the 80s. We're going back to Thatcher. Back we to we never thatch. get too far away from Thatcher, do we? <laughs> a little bit show. of politics. <laughs> uh, just as a quick intro, let's uh, let's have a look at when The New Statesman was made. It was actually made by Yorkshire Television, shot up in mm. Leeds. And Series 1 came out in 1987. Series 2, early 89, January, February 89. They did an hour-long special, Who Shot Alan Bastard, yeah. a year later. And then Series 3 in early 91 and then finally series four which actually came out in late 92 and it's interesting the timing isn't it because it, it straddles the end of the thatcher era so the first couple of series we you know margaret thatcher's the prime minister and alan is in mm-hmm. her thrall and then in the second uh, sorry the third series john major is now the prime minister and, yeah. and it, that does change the the background dynamics a little bit mm. margaret thatcher was ousted mm. by the conservative party after they'd already written the third series, and they had to scramble to, oh, really? to rewrite everything and make it work. We'll, we'll look into that in a bit more detail okay. later. But yes, quick basics for anyone who, who isn't familiar with the show. Uh, the New Statesman follows Alan Bastard MP, who is newly elected to the House of Commons as a Conservative MP, and he s- is self-styled most right-wing member of Parliament mm. and is a, a really thoroughly nasty piece of work. And so, yes, this is obviously was created to satirise Thatcherite uh, Tories, basically, and then Thatcher was ousted, and, and the, the show had to yeah. readjust slightly, and so we'll, it'll be interesting to see how all that comes about. We will be looking at specifically, uh, the episode we're looking at is the first episode of series two. Fatal Extraction. Fatal Extraction, which, you know, we saw it had series one to bed in and this is kind of, there's some changes that took place. So we'll have a look at that one in a lot of detail. Quite a lot to talk about there. Yeah, it's a good episode and we'll we'll obviously go through that in a bit more detail. But before before we get stuck into that, just give me a bit of background on how New Statesman came about. Well, it was written by Lawrence Marks and Maurice Gran, and we'll mm-hmm. get into their details and their background a bit more in a while, because there's a lot of interesting things to talk about there. Yeah, sure. But I think the most interesting thing here is that this show was written for Rick Mail. Basically, Rick Mail met the writers at an event and said, hey, why don't you write something for me? And a bit of toing and froing uh, later, and they kind of decided to do that. And they said, okay. "What character do you want to play?" He said, "I want to kind of really play up the most venal aspects of my personality." <laughs> and they were like, yeah. "Oh, let's make you a conservative MP. It's perfect." <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I, I, I thought it'd be interesting to look at Rick Mail before we kind of get into our episode because he yeah. is such such the 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 massive heart of the, this of the show. Obviously, it's built the, around his The new his statesman style. is Rick Mail, isn't it? You yeah. know, we have some supporting characters, of course, but but you know, this is his story. Yes, and we have seen a little bit of Rick Mail before because we we did look at Bottom briefly. Yeah, we well, we did the the Halloween episode of Bottom, didn't we? And we looked at Filthy Rich and Cat Flap on one of our forgotten sitcoms. Yes. Um, so yeah, you know, we talked about Rick Mail a little bit. Well, firstly, where just where in the timeline does the New Statesman? So we have the Young Ones, then Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, and then Bottom. They're the sort of that that's the the timeline. So where does the New Statesman sit there? Because it's sort of separate, isn't it? Right in the middle of that. So yeah, the Young Ones was up to about eighty four. Did that finish? Something like that. Mm. Uh, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap was in early 1987, and then yep. this series was late 87. So okay. it's it's right after that. Bottom was 91, I think. It was right. right okay. a- it was kind of after the new statement was well established. So yeah, this this was kind of Rick Mail is looking for another big role. The Young Ones is done. Yeah, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap hasn't really gone anywhere. Uh, yep. What can we do with him? And Actually, it was a new direction, really, if you if you think Very about so. what he's known for. And it was kind of Rick Mail playing an adult, <laughs> which kind of... Wasn't well, I'm really interested before. in... Because when I look back in hindsight at this, it, this is... this You know, I, we just listed their bottom, Filthy Rich and Cat Flap and the young ones and the character of rick in those three is is very similar you know slightly different circumstances but it's basically you know he's, he's performing the same role in many ways mm-hmm. or he's certainly performing the role in a similar way mm-hmm. this is very very different 
Now, it stands out when you look back. What I want to know is, at the time, was this seen as a radical departure for Rick Mail, or was this, you know, how was it viewed? Perhaps not radical, but certainly it was noted. I, I think, for the most part, it was like, oh, Rick Mail's quite handsome, isn't he? <laughs> when, he when he's not just being grotesque and, well, he is yeah. grotesque but in a different way. And, like, he's well, he's like that, the whole part of the character is very tailored and the hair is all coiffured mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, he's like, oh, he's actually quite a handsome man and, and, and he's very charming, you know, obviously that's part of the character mm-hmm. as well. So I think that was perhaps the departure. Uh, but then, the, the tone of the comedy is still there. There's still a lot of that Rick Mail style in there. But yeah, I mean, to, just to look at the background a little bit. So Rick Mail, his his parents actually were drama teachers and, and kind of produced plays as well. So he was on the stage from a very young age, you know, as, a, as he was a child actor in that sense. Mm. Um, and so that's he ended up going to university to study drama at the University of Manchester, where, of course, he met mm-hmm. Adrian Edmondson and Ben Elton, uh, yeah. become very fruitful elements of his career. And Lisa Meyer, of course, who um, he was in a personal relationship as well as writing the new ones. Yeah. Uh, started working on the stand-up circuit, created that character of Rick, which obviously became part of the Young Ones, all that kind of stuff. The Dangerous Brothers with Adrian Edmondson. Was the character of Rick, was that a f- sort of at least partly formed character before the Young Ones? Then? Yes, yes. Right, so it was it was incorporated into the sitcom. Yes, and and the others, like Nigel Planer had a kind of hippie character that he would play, okay. and, uh, and then Adrian Edmondson, I mean... That's just what he does in everything, really. He's yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, and and obviously it was just that whole alternative comedy thing in the eighties, and Rick Mail was really one of the big rising stars of it, and and it's obvious to see why so. he was a huge ball of energy and really stands out as different, uh, but mm-hmm. in a in a good way. Well, is it in a good way? I, you know, we people who've listened to our other episodes where we've discussed him will know that I, I'm not a massive Rick Mail fan, I, and I generally find it all a little bit too much, a little bit in your face. And I think I think I did enjoy it at the time, but now when I go back and look, it's it's just it's, it almost seems a little bit over the top for me. Yes. And what's interesting to me is that watching the New Statesman, it's toned down. And it works much, much better for me. I'm, I, mm-hmm. I enjoyed Rick Mail's performance in The New Statesman way more than I enjoyed Filthy Rich and Cat Flat and Bottom. Yes, and I think it's it's apparent that he has not written it. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, but it's also apparent that he's having an influence. Uh, we'll, sure. we'll, we'll get into the details of that a little yeah, bit, I yeah. think, as well. What rick mail needs is a, a, a just a little bit of a controlling factor like you say just to, to take those excesses off mm, but mm. i think having someone that wants to go to those excesses is great and you then then you just need someone to kind of corral them down a little and go all right come on let's go over here yeah, i think yeah. that's a really nice great kind of working relationship if you can get it uh, when i was looking through his cv though you you've mentioned those sitcoms you kind of you've said already and bottom was for, mm-hmm. bottom went from 91 to about 95 when it was actually on tv obviously they were doing it for a long time after that live shows but what did he do after that well that's a good question i think the only thing i really know him from after that was much later which is man down with greg mm. davis yeah which i really love man down i'm a big fan but actually i didn't particularly like rick Mail's character in that either for exactly the same reasons it's just all a bit much all a bit over the top yeah. it was rick Mail doing rick Mail, but 20 years on but, but nevertheless, you asked me the question, what came after Bottom? And, and, and my answer was 20 years later. So I don't know is the answer, Alan. What, what, what did he do in that intervening period? I know he had a, you know, he had a serious accident at one point, didn't he? But presumably he did. that wasn't the only thing. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of sitcom, not much. The only other sitcom that he was the lead of was Believe Nothing, which was kind of a direct follow-up to this because it was written by Marks and Gran and it was mm. playing a very similar character, but in a, just a slightly different world, playing a character called uh, Adonis Canute. I don't know that. I don't remember that. Well, I tell you what, let's talk about that in a little bit more detail later because it's it is really when we, when we talk about Marks and Gran. Yeah, yeah, because it's not okay. it's not real it's not a sequel to the New Statesman, but it's a very similar character and a similar idea with the rights. Right. So it's definitely it was designed as a kind of spiritual follow up. But that's the only other sort of lead in the sitcom he's got. Other, everything else is just Odd little bits here and there, and then you know, man down. Yeah, he was in that for a year. And, that, and when then, did I've just I've just remembered he went to Hollywood and made a film, didn't he? Uh, when when was that? When did that come? Drop in the Dead timeline? Fred was ninety one. 
Okay. So right in the heart of all this. And yeah, that mm. was sort of relatively successful, but it certainly didn't launch him as a career. No, it's a shame, really, because even even then it was it was like one of ours going over there sort of thing. <laughs> and you, always, you, you love to see it. You want to see him do well. But it, yeah, I don't think the film was a flop, was it? But But he never kind of, you know, he didn't build on it. No, and I don't know exactly why that is. Perhaps he's just not quite the right mentality for the american system mm, uh, just perhaps yes. a little bit too much of a live wire <laughs> yeah uh, I but i think if you can harness that like i said I, you can get a lot of gold there but yeah i mean he was never short of work particularly but just lots of odd little things here and there a bit of voice work bit of a you know he was in a couple episodes of jonathan creek and, and that sort of stuff mm-hmm. did quite a bit of kids stuff as well i think his energy is well tuned to, yeah, to children's yeah, tv definitely. that sort of thing well as i say i think it's interesting that things are toned down here you know there is still in this rick male performance there's still a little bit of sort, of sort of gurning and what i might call overacting and you know there's a lot of violence there's a lot of slapstick type violence perpetrated on poor old peers mm-hmm. but even that it's not quite as slapstick it's more controlled yes and, and, and like i said i, I enjoyed it more there's an interesting scene in um, series four. There's an episode called Hail and Farewell, which is about neo-Nazis. And basically, Alan Bastard is he's, he's aping Hitler. So he's wearing mm. a brown shirt with a swastika armband and he's waving his arms around as he speaks. You know, we've all seen that pathé footage of <laughs> yeah. Hitler. Doing actually a very, a very good it's a, it's a really good uh, impression. physical but, embodiment but of it. What, what I thought was here... Rick Mayle is doing an impression of Hitler and it feels like he's toned himself down. <laughs> so so that, that tells you everything I think about Rick Mayle's normal <laughs> levels of, uh, of activity. <laughs> but what, what, in general, I think, you know, I've watched seven or eight episodes of this in the last week. You can tell that Rick Mayle is enjoying himself. Yeah. And it really, enjoy, it really helps the characterization of Alan Bastard because Alan's an awful awful person mm-hmm. but he's charming he's that he's got a dark charm which is which is why the character works on any level it, you know he he's loving it rick mail is really enjoying mm. inhabiting that awful person mm. and i think that's why it works i think rick may you know i don't think anyone else could do this and i don't think rick mail could do it unless he was really enjoying it yeah i agree with that i i think i i sort of hesitate to say this but i think it might be his best work well i i've written down this is my favorite rick mail performance i i completely agree with for that. the reasons we've mentioned it's kind of it's got the spirit of rick mail but just harnessed in the right way mm-hmm. and and like the young ones it's it's a little bit more of its time it, like it was its moment it was punk but that doesn't necessarily age that well it doesn't necessarily no. work that well it, it, out of exactly. context you know, if you listen to the Sex Pistols, they're rubbish. Yeah, yeah. You know, they are rubbish. Like, the, that was the point. That was the point. They were unpolished, raw, and that was great in 1977. But you listen to them now, and they're rubbish. Now, <laughs> Young Ones is probably, you know, I wouldn't quite go that far. But, but, but well, I suppose I would, really. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's, you know it, it, what, it was groundbreaking at the time, but when you go back 30 years later and watch it, you know, okay, you can see the edges here. You can see how, how rough and ready it is. Yes, I, I agree with that. But I also think that even within the New Statesman, the tone changed slightly over the first couple of series. I'd like to discuss that. But the episode we're looking at is the very first episode of series two. So let's start there. I think that's a good place to start. Let's get stuck into that, yeah. Yeah. So I guess we have to start with a theme tune. It's the first thing we get. interesting because i recognize the theme tune obviously it came straight back to me was it written for this or is it a piece of classical music yeah it's it's an old piece i mean i don't know i've written this down i don't know these names it was written by modest musodsky a russian composer modest Modest musodsky i've got to confess i don't know that name either it's just a small part of of a big composition and it was just given a slightly different arrangement for for this but uh yeah it it wasn't written especially Mm -hmm. for it but it's quite a quite a tame opening credit sequence it's just sort of it, i mean it's not quite still images but it may as well be <laughs> yeah the camera well they are still images but the camera's sort of moving across there are sort of press cuttings torn up photographs there's a there's a headshot of alan bastard preening himself and looking uh, regal and it, it, it kind of looked half like a like a sort of scrapbook of alan bastard's life and yeah. half like a ransom note it was <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a weird little collection of artifacts yeah, and then we, we end with a sort of image of, 
uh, Alan and a sort of torn up Union flag scattered around him. Mm-hmm. So it's you know that's gonna that sort of tells you <laughs> the attitude we've got, I suppose. And then in later series mm-hmm. we get the European Union flag, of course, because he yeah. He I mean, we'll talk about that later. But that's really interesting. In the later series he becomes an MEP instead of an mm-hmm. MP, and that's that, that's fascinating. Well, in the context of the time and of today, I suppose. But I tell you what, before we quite get into this episode, let's start with the name. Alan mm-hmm. Beresford Bastard. And <laughs> somehow they get away with it. Bastard is not a name. It's not a well-known no. surname. It's not even it's close not to name. being a, a sort of posh name or anything. It's just Bastard <laughs> with an apostrophe in it. And yeah. char- other characters call him Bastard all the time. Uh, sometimes yes. as a deliberate insult, sometimes as a kind of mocking his name. You know, it's a joke that works every time. It's fine. But how do they... Why am I not more annoyed by that? I guess is what I'm trying to say. I think it's just familiarity, isn't it? You know, you kind of... It's Alan Bastard. That's, that's, that's the name of the character. So you kind of got used to the idea. But you're right. It doesn't stand up to any scrutiny at all. <laughs> uh, interestingly, though, he's called Alan Beresford Bastard. Do you know why he's called Beresford? Why that's his Beresford. name? Beresford. Uh, let me have a little think about that. It's not Norman Tebbit's middle name, is it? It is, exactly. Oh! <laughs> that was a complete guess! Oh, I'm so pleased with myself. I wonder if you picked that up subconsciously somewhere, because that is I'm, actually Norman I, Tebbit. I, it's not just someone's middle name. Oh my, do you know what? That that may be well deep. I may have, in the 1987 general election, seen his name read out or something. I'm, I'm really pleased about that. <laughs> you remember how bad I am at quizzes? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the Beresford is uh, just a nod to Norman Tebbit. I don't know if it, obviously it's not based on Norman Tebbit or anything. It's just a little. Mm, of course not. No, and it, you'd be a liar if you said it was. And <laughs> open to all sorts of legislation. <laughs> Let's get into our episode. So we we actually start with Alan on a TV discussion show, sort of. Well, it's question time. It's question time is what it is. Yeah. The, there is a presenter who is blatantly Robin Day. So Robin Day used to present mm-hmm. Question Time in the 80s. And he, he was famous for wearing a, a bow tie. So this character's got the same glasses, he's got the same bow tie. I'm not sure that he's actually called Robin Day. Well, he's definitely not because we actually, in within the episode, we see the show end and the credits start to roll up and it's credited mm-hmm. as Alan Hargreaves, who is the actor who is playing that role, actually. So it's not, but which is weird because they, they throughout this series, they regularly have real tv presenters kind of playing themselves well maybe he didn't want to be involved robin day but the other thing is uh, and we'll get to this in a minute I, I, there was a, a yorkshire television presenter who appears later a newsreader mm. who i recognize because i grew up in yorkshire but but the point is it's why tv robin day and question time were on the bbc so perhaps ah, that's right. why yes, maybe, he didn't yes. appear so we've also got on the panel of this Question Time show, obviously Alan's there, and there's a, a left winger, the leader of Hackney Council, Georgina Pitt, mm-hmm. who is, I think, a Diane Abbott proxy. I think, right. you know, Diane Abbott now in 2022 has a very different reputation to what she had then in the 80s. She was one of those uh, loony left, ty- or she was seen as one of those loony left type uh, characters <laughs> along with Ken Livingston. And, she, and within the within the episode here, that is the role that Georgina Pitt occupies. She's a... She's a left winger, leader of the council. That's interesting. I I don't think this character is distinctly trying to emulate a, a character, a, a person, uh, for, f- like you sort of alluded to earlier, legal reasons, <laughs> but mm. especially yeah, considering right. what she does uh, at happens, the end of the episode. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. she is obviously representing the sort of left wing council leader of a of a London borough, and Diane Abbott would sort of fall into that category, I guess. Mm. Georgina Pitt is played by Suzette Llewellyn. Yeah. Do you recognise her Who's from she anything? Then? She's I, kind of I, I recognised her face. I, I definitely recognised her, but I, I couldn't tell you where from. Well, this this episode went out uh, a few months before she became uh, a series regular in Surgical Spirit. Ah, okay. Right, yeah, that would be it. That she was one it. of the regulars on that for five years, and that was that's mm-hmm. kind of her main sitcom lineage. But she's just one of those faces you see on TV quite a lot. She's Actually, for the last couple of years, she's been on EastEnders. Oh, really? She was playing the wife of Rudolph Walker, his character. In, ah, in right. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, she yeah. is good twenty years younger than him, but I don't know if that's <laughs> explained in the uh, thing. Uh, and another more recent um, sort of sitcom role, uh, she was in The Windsors. Um, you know the Harry Enfield thing about about the yes, royal family, the royal family thing, which yeah. I haven't really seen anything of it. But she's plays no, she plays uh, Meghan Markle's mother in that as a sort of semi okay, semi regular casting, uh, yeah. character. Yeah. Yeah. 
so yeah, that's Suzette Llewellyn. She's got a bit of sitcom legacy, but this was before she was kind of well known or anything. But well, this is this. So let's talk that the, we sort of see this snippet of Question Time, and and the setup is it's a big argument between Alan and mm-hmm. and this this left winger Georgina Pitt. And what we this is the first episode of series two, and this is our introduction back to the character of Alan. And the first line he's talking about abortion. No, no, I did not say that I opposed abortion. What I oppose is the so-called woman's right to choose. It should be the state's right to choose. Ugly, stupid, poor people should not be allowed to have children. That is the most disgusting thing I've ever heard. Wow, we are in and running. <laughs> Welcome to the character, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, like what an intro. And like you say, yeah, this is opening the second series, so maybe they just wanted to sort of put it right out there straight away. So Alan Bastard is just, well, let, let's put this out there straight away. He's a psychopath uh, in, in the sort of oh, very yes. classical sense. Oh, he, yes. He's outwardly very charming he's very good at manipulating people he has mm-hmm. absolutely no emotional empathy for others whatsoever uh, mm-hmm. and i mean that's that's psychopath i don't definition of a psychopath. I, I don't know if they literally knew that and were kind of writing it to that or if they were just writing callous <laughs> bastard and they um and it was just psychopathic behavior i mean it, it sort of gives you a hell of a lot of freedom to just mm. do anything <laughs> like, say the unsayable that's that's yeah. our shtick isn't it saying the unsayable Yes, and he phrases it in terms of the world of politics as this kind of mm. right-wing firebrand who is too right-wing even to kind of climb the echelons of the Conservative Party, but mm. is the sort of person you have on the back on the back benches as a as the more extreme view, someone someone who will throw their things out there. Are you familiar with the concept of the Overton window? No, I don't know who Overton was, but it's obviously some academic who came up with this theory. The Overton window is the the range from left to right or from extreme to extreme of opinions that are acceptable or oh, no, not acceptable, yeah. that are voiced. Right. Yeah. So if you're the conservative government and you want to do something that is considered a little bit right wing, a little bit extreme, it's in your interest to have someone on the back benches stretching that Overton window further and further. So you seem less extreme, you seem more mainstream, you seem more centrist. And so it's useful for governments to have people on their back benches dragging that acceptability across away from them. Just to make you look better. <laughs> and you know what? In the 80s, there were people like this. We can talk about who is Alan Bastard based on. The name I would come up with is Alan Clark. Now, Alan Clark is probably most famous because he was a diarist. Mm-hmm. And so you can read Alan Clark's diaries. He was a backbench MP. He became a junior minister under Thatcher, but he never, he never made the cabinet. Uh, he wasn't as bad as Alan Bastard by any means, because obviously this is a huge caricature. But but it is it is a caricature of uh, Alan Clark was a wealthy, very right wing, very uh, lax attitudes towards his marital vows, very uh, <laughs> very venal, grasping. His diaries are brilliant because he's so indiscreet and he's he's so indiscreet about other people. He's so indiscreet about himself and what he's after and what he wants. And it, it, they're a great read if you're interested in this period of politics. But Alan Bastard is is essentially Alan Clark turned up to eleven. Mm. So and, and and what we're getting here straight away. Uh, we're, we're setting up for this episode the conflict with Georgina Pitt and so the first things he says to her is racist and sexist and, and basically says she's not English enough to have a political opinion in this country mm-hmm. there's some sh- there's some shocking racism in there yeah and it's interesting like of all the things that Alan does in the show like I mean he literally murders people and he does some pretty terrible things but the the stuff that really jumps out watching it 35 years later uh, racism homophobia is quite a big one mm, yes. uh, and then the sexism not the sexism as such but sexual harassment and often sexual oh, yeah. assault of people yes. which we'll we see in just a moment <laughs> in the next scene that follows this see I think it's really interesting you know I don't want to open the a can of worms about cancel culture because there's not really anything new to be said about that but but i do think that in 1989 the things that alan says are unacceptable mm-hmm. but you're able to laugh at them mm-hmm. <laughs> whereas if this were made now it would be beyond the pale it would be unacceptable to even be saying those things yes exactly if you wrote this character now his extremes would be different yeah Th- there are people who will say these things on twitter yeah you know th- these views now exist and i think that might be why it's not funny anymore. You you can't say that. It's not funny. It's not a joke. Whereas in 1989, it was obviously a caricature. Yeah. 
Yeah, I guess so. But uh, even within the context of this episode, he does a little diatribe and belittles Georgina Pitt and then sort of throws it to the audience within the show, within the show, and they give him a huge round of applause <laughs> because he's, mm-hmm. yes, you proved your point. You explained mm-hmm. yourself, yes. Uh, he's obviously supposed to be popular, and, and that's a running thing. Populist. He's a populist. Yes, it's, that's a running thing throughout the show that he's, because mm-hmm. he's good at managing his media presence and his... Mm-hmm persona the public like him or at least like that he's there and is that and is entertaining in some way well we can't yeah we we can't go any further without talking about nigel farage can we you know (laughs) i think nigel farage is the spiritual heir of alan bastard and and and, you know i will ironically as i said alan becomes an mep in 1992 yes Um, and the 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 very last episode of the series alan forms a, a splinter party of the conservatives mm. based purely on the on the grounds of we want to leave the eu and yeah. he he creates a great divide within the country and they go to election yeah. and he wins <laughs> uh, and and be, sort of sets himself up as leader of that, the country I mean, that's farage's so. dream isn't it that's <laughs> yeah, farage's <wet> yeah. dream. <laughs> exactly yeah so i the, the, it's amazing parallels and last time i watched the show it was much less relevant to me, <laughs> I suppose, yeah. several years ago. Yeah. And that's what I mean. That's what I mean about, you know, you watch that in 1992 and it's all a bit silly and far-fetched. And now you're like, oh God, it's a bit too close to home. I'm not sure I like this. It's making me uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's go back to the episode, Alan. So, okay, yeah. um, so uh, the, the show finishes, the, the, as you said, the credits roll, the, the show within the show, the credits roll. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we sort of see a little bit of backstage and, um, and Bastard is, is, is chatting up Georgina Pitt and he's, as you, as you quite put it, sexually assaulting her. Um, he, I mean, he is. He, we see here he is a sexual predator. Yeah, and really, the the only sort of unrealistic element of this scene is that she actually agrees to get in his car and to let him mm. drive her home, and he uses that as an opportunity to kind of trap her in his car and and yeah, attempt to sexually assault her. And now, in terms of all, in terms of the actual what I would term assault or, or over harassment, which is. Yeah. You know, a fine line, but it's there. And (laughs) Alan crosses that line (laughs) repeatedly. And I think, for the most part, the reason this show gets away with that overall is because in in most of those occasions, he gets shot down, often with physical violence, and but always with some kind of humiliating belittling of him. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just enough take the edge off the character to just make all this kind of okay. But then you Mm. still will have times where he's with someone who is a little bit more vulnerable and sort of fall for his charm. Uh, And and that seems a little bit There's an episode, uh, I forget which episode it was, I apologise, but it was where he's basically, I mean, he's got a a tour of girl guides going around the House of Commons and he's, you know, he propositions one of the girl guides and he has a night in a hotel with her. I don't know how old the girl guide is supposed to be, but it is basically paedophilia. (laughs) Yeah. And that, and again, that's something you, uh, and I get from watching old, sh- older shows, you see a lot more often <laughs> in the 80s where it's like, you know, 16, 16, 15, maybe, you know, let's say, what? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, even Dear John deals with that, albeit he's kind of like, oh my God, I didn't mean to do that. No, I think, I think that, that, is a, that is a way in which our views have changed a great deal. Culture in the has changed, years. yeah. Do you know what? Something else I'm, uh, I've just been reminded myself of, uh, with it being Rick Mail, in the comic strip presents bad news. Do you remember that where they where they're driving off on tour the, this rock and roll band and they pick up two schoolgirls mm. to take away on tour with them? Don French is one yeah, of yeah, them. Yeah. So again, you know, different times in the eighties. It was girls, just fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> to go back to our episode, then um, the point behind this scene when Georgina just you know casts him aside and, and leaves is he steps out into the marshes, falls onto the ground, and uh, like Jed Clampett just <laughs> stumbles upon <laughs> some, a bubble and crude. <laughs> Black gold. Yeah. Texas tea. <laughs> yeah, it just falls onto some onto the soil and it's oil. Like it's that easy. Yeah, I mean, I don't... I, I wouldn't consider myself a petrochemicals expert. But even where oil does exist, you don't just fall on the grass and get it on your face, do you? Not where people play football every Sunday. <laughs> no, someone would have noticed. No. 
Like, I'm not saying it's inconceivable that there is oil on Hackney Marshes, but well, I suppose I am saying that. I'm, I'm <laughs> saying it, it could be it could be a couple of miles under Hackney Marshes. <laughs> but for the purposes of a sitcom plot, the point is <laughs> Alan Beresford Bastard has discovered oil on Hackney Marshes. So now all he needs to do is buy all the land before anybody else finds out about it. And that's the setup of the episode. That's the motor running. Just to point that out, actually, what I do really like about the New Statesman is Every episode has a very distinct plot. Like, there's always a yeah. good, solid... In, in, in quite literally a plot, like a scheme, usually, at the centre of it. Yes. There's there's not a lot of filler in this in this series. They, they touch on a lot of current political issues as well. Mm. You, know, you know, a lot of, the, a lot of political themes. So, you know, North Sea Oil was running out. That was a big, that was a big problem in the, in the 80s. Our, our, our reliance on foreign oil. And the, we, we, they touch on that on another episode, don't they? Yes, yes. Well, Alan mm. uses it as a way to make money, of course. Of course. Well, so in the episode, we, we, we cut now and we go we go to the office, which is probably the main set, isn't it, for mm. for the New Statesman? So we're in this House of Commons office somewhere up above the, the chamber where Alan shares an office with Piers Fletcher Dervish. So this is the first time we see Piers. So he's played by Michael Troughton. Mm-hmm. So we saw Michael Troughton in Sean's show as the Recently, landlord of the yes, local we pub. Did, yeah. But but yeah, tell me a bit more about him. Well, yeah, Michael Troughton. I mean, this is definitely what he's most famous for. Piers Fletcher Dervish certainly it certainly is. Sean's show is the other sort of main sitcom role he had. He appears as a regular in Get Well Soon, which I've looked at on Forgotten Sitcoms. And that's we've covered his sitcom career there, pretty much. <laughs> we, we've done it. Yeah. He's the odd appearance and other things. But in terms of a sort of a regular gig. But he's probably most famous, apart from the acting side, is he's the son of Patrick Troughton. I'm not sure that pays all that well. <laughs> like, like, what has he been doing for the last 20 years? Well, he has he has actually made money from it. He, he's written a biography of Patrick Troughton. He he okay. seems to be a fairly regular on the Doctor Who circuit, you know, on that convention right. circuit. So he certainly has done all right out of being the son of Patrick Troughton. Fair enough. Uh, Patrick Troughton famously kind of lived a double life. He had two families and was kind of flitted between the two. So Michael Troughton was the the youngest son of his first family, and he left that family quite soon after Michael was born. But right. from the sounds of it, they had a fairly solid relationship nonetheless. But his elder brother is David Troughton, who's also quite a well-known actor, and he followed the family uh, family tradition, really. He wasn't didn't expect to. He was more of a he's more into science, but uh, got the acting bug. And he mm-hmm. served his apprenticeship uh, in, in a children's theatre. He was worked as a, a, an ASM, doing occasional roles in kids' theatre. Now, you've told me what ASM is before. Assistant stage manager. Yes, yes. So basically, you're running around backstage doing things, helping organize things. But then it's like, oh, we've got this character has two lines. Get on and do that. And it's kind of just a way of earning your stripes. Mm -hmm. And then as you go along, people go, oh, you're good. Do this, do this. And you get bigger roles. And then uh, went from that into rep a couple of years. You know, he really did the old school way. He didn't go to drama school. He just kind of got into it and, and worked his way up. And mm-hmm. just broke into TV, preferred TV to theatre, so really focused on that, and got little role in this, little role in that, little role in so, uh, and yeah. built his career. And before the New Statesman, which was very much a breakthrough role for him, he was best known for a sort of semi-recurring character on Minder. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, Piers Fletcher Dervish was the one that broke him. Uh, he did Sean's show, kind of in between series. He carried on acting, but then. In around in the early two thousand around two thousand two, he stopped acting and returned to his first love of science. He got a, a sort of physics <laughs> physics degree on the right, Open okay. University and became a physics teacher for a while. Wow. Uh, um, so, but then once he'd kind of earned his teaching stripes, he managed to get a job as a drama teacher and uh, sort of a bit more okay, a bit more experience there. Uh, in twenty thirteen, that kind of area, he went back to acting and he's done a handful of things since then. But now. And you can go to his website and and uh, hire him if you like. He is mostly uh, making money um, doing audio books. He does uh, voice work. He's got he's built a, he's oh. built a studio and his own thing, and he kind of produces his own content, uh, not just doing okay. the voices, but he can uh, kind of do all the production as well. So That's he's just got a little kind of one man uh, kind of cottage industry thing going on there, which is very much the, the norm for for that kind of work these days because yeah. it's cheaper than getting people in for a studio and hiring a producer and stuff like that. So he seems to be doing pretty well, well out of that. We're recording a podcast from our, our spare bedroom. So. Yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> so, yeah, and uh, so he seems to be that where his money is, and he seems to do the Doctor Who stuff fairly often as well. He, he seems to be quite into that. Just happy to go around telling anecdotes about his father and... Uh, 
but doesn't doesn't act that much on on screen these days. Well, let's talk about let's talk about the character mm-hmm. of Piers. And so Piers is monumentally stupid. He's yeah. always the butt of Alan's violence. Mm-hmm. But he's, you know, the, he the, he is the caricature of the posh boy who got through Eton. At, at some point, his father dies, and he inherits the the baronetcy. And yeah. you know, he's just he, he he's caricaturing that that idiot, that upper class idiot. Yeah, and and very much has no control over his own life. Really, it's just kind of like, oh well, I did this because I was told to do this, and I, I became a well, lawyer. Because yeah, that, I did this. and I think that's the problem. I've written my, I've written down here. Is he too stupid? <laughs> but perhaps perhaps a better way of, of phrasing that would be has he you know has he gotten too little free will or or too little agency perhaps really what i like about piers is that i think it's a fine fine performance and uh it's it's Mm -hmm. really consistent throughout Uh, and and i think that's very important to have that foil for alan and 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 really he is the most important character besides alan you know even though uh, so the the wife sarah is in quite a lot of the episodes she is not as big an influence on the show as as Piers. No. He's such an important character. Like I say, I think it's a really great performance. That that balance of an idiot who is taken advantage of all the time, but you don't really feel that sorry for him. <laughs> I think there's something quite. He's, that's he, true. Actually. He's not quite likable. That's enough. true. And that is really good because point, he's just Alan, because... sort of pathetic in a way. Yeah, he's the victim of horrendous bullying. But I never feel for him. (laughs) You know, he's he's pathetic. You know, he's... he's And I think that's... Whatever they're tapping into is the exact opposite of Alan does terrible things, but he's so charming that you you still kind of like him. He's like a Uh likeable bastard, you know. And... It's the opposite of that, whatever that would be, <laughs> because yeah, you don't yeah, dislike charming. you don't dislike Piers. It's not like oh, he's got all this privilege yeah. and he's been you know he's got everything on a silver spoon, but That's he's true. just pathetic, and you just like, well, I don't care then. <laughs> but I think yeah. that is good for this character. Uh, yeah, I mean he's he's supposed to represent the the constituency of devisers, uh, which in real life is just yeah. At this time was represented by basically the son of the. <laughs> The, the landowner of the, you know, who was it? Uh, I can't remember the name off the top of my head. It's not someone particularly famous, uh, okay. politician or anything, but it was just like a classic landed gentry politician for 35 years on the back benches. And you know what? Those, like, you go back centuries, the local landowner would be a lord and he would have a seat in the House of Lords, and the oldest son would be the MP. Mm. So the oldest son would, would be given the, the local seat and would go to Westminster as a member of parliament. And then when the old man died, Go he moved up to the House of Lords and his son would become would become the MP. Yeah, and that was sort yeah. of the way rural seats worked. And, you know, back in the 80s, there were still quite a few of those families, those old families that had a local seat. It wasn't quite in the, in their gifting the same way. You know, we, we have universal suffrage now. People vote. But these were hard Tory seats. The the cliche of you could put a donkey, a blue rosette on a donkey mm. and it would win. And, you know, they basically did that. They put a blue rosette on the idiot son and they became MPs. And you know what? There are still a few of those. There's not as many these days, but there are still a couple of those, mostly Tory MPs, who are, you know, the third son of the Duke of the such and such. Yeah, and I mean, even Alan, Alan Bastard here, is a similar situation. So he represents a fictional constituency of Halton Halton Price. Price. And the reason he is so kind of beholden to his wife, who we'll talk about later, Mm. is because her father is the local landowner and he controls Mm. the Conservative Party. And whoever gets put up as Conservative is going to get voted in. So he he decides who to put up. And so that's why he's kind of had to marry into it. No, you can't, obviously, you can't send your daughter to Westminster. That'd be ridiculous. (laughs) (laughs) Marry her off and send the chap. Yeah, and interestingly, Halton Price is a real place, but it wasn't a constituency until 1997 when some oh, boundary, boundary changes, changes yeah. um, and the the constituency of Halton Price and Howden was created do you have any idea who cuz quite a well known person yes Oh, so this is this is like a pub quiz. This is just as much. I, I should know this, and I will know as soon as you tell me. It's not Harriet Harman, is it? No, no. It's uh, so it's been the same person has held the seat since 1997. Go on, tell me, David Davis. David Davis. And David Davis is not a, a million miles away from 
I'll never start either. <laughs> so, so we're talking about how stupid Piers is, and this this scene gives us a nice introduction to that. So Piers is basically trying to work out the fax machine because he yes. thinks it's a photocopier. And interestingly, you know, this is a fax machine. Fax machine. <laughs> it was cutting edge technology there, and obviously Alan's got one because he's a modern man. And then uh, because he's messed up the fax machine, Alan then threatens him with a drill, which is a, our first bit of slapstick uh, violence visited upon Piers. Yes, yes. And a particular ridiculous one, this one. I mean, what that drill is insane. <laughs> like it's just a really big drill bit, isn't it? It's like a comedy drill bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It must be a real thing, but it's like the sort of thing you'd go down in a coal mine with. <laughs> Should we talk about physical comedy for a little bit? That seems like a, a relevant thing to do. First of all, I want to say I think Rick Mail is excellent at slapstick. I think mm. his career bears that out and... You can take that to completely caricature levels, like bottom. And here I think we get that, again, that nice balance, like you're saying, of quite over-the-top caricature violence, but it's like, it's one smack to the head with a frying pan instead of ten. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's the yeah. sort of difference yeah. we're looking uh, yeah, at. Yeah, I like that. I, I, I'm very impressed, but I, I think, if anything, I prefer when he's receiving um, violence as opposed to giving it. But why is, why is that? Is that because you think he performs it better or because you think the character deserves it? Uh, no, I think it's just down to performance. I think he's he's amazing mm. at it. Where and like Michael Troughton uh, receives violence in a kind of more realistic way, I guess, in which he's just sort of cowers yeah. and is abused, <laughs> and um, yeah. he'll get his head smashed through a window, uh, mm. for example, which we'll see later in this episode. But yeah, this he's also totally submissive to it. <laughs> he's like <laughs> Alan says, bend over, and and he does, <laughs> and it's it's a weird uh, sadomasochistic yeah. relationship. But, well, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that I guess it's the Eton thing isn't it it's the public school you imagine Piers was the sort of kid who was bullied everybody was bullied but Piers was the pathetic kid who hung out with the school bully because he wanted to be friends with him and would would just get stick every day all day yes and it develops a nice relationship between the two of them uh, that Piers is so afraid of him. It means Alan can send him off on errands and make him do whatever mm. he wants, really. And for whatever psychological reason, it all works. <laughs> and for the, for a comedy yeah. level, it, it works anyway. But yeah, so here we're, he's about to um, penetrate Piers with a, a ridiculously large drill, but is distracted mm. because he, he discovers that he has struck oil and that there is, uh, you know, a fortune uh, down yeah. there. He calls Georgina. Uh, I don't suppose you remember what he says on the phone. Uh, no, but I'll tell you what I've written here. <laughs> Alan rings Georgina with some serious grade A racism. <laughs> I'll tell That's you what, what I've says. written. I'll tell you Go what on. he says. I'm going to do it, but in the epi- in this show, I, I will drop the clip in, but I'll do it for your benefit. Okay. He says, What then, big bitch? It's Alan Rostaman Bastardia. Check out the love power, girl. <laughs> Yeah, I was right, wasn't I? <laughs> Serious grade A <eight> racism. <laughs> Ridiculous. And it's going to get worse later in the episode. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so so the plot here is that, you know, he wants to buy this land so that he can make all this money. So the next scene, we go to Georgina's house flat. Yeah. And he's trying to butter her up. So he, he turns up with roses and he gives her this big speech. And he's selling the idea of um, Hackney Enterprise Zone. He wants to bring jobs and money and investment to Hackney. That's how he's trying to pitch it to her. Yeah, do you know what? I I, I kind of would have liked to develop this actual, the, the kind of clean storyline here a bit more because mm. he's trying to sell it to her. Like, oh, this will be great. It'll create jobs in the area and, and all this sort of stuff. And she's like, well, that, don't, come on, mate. Why would you be interested in that? And his line is like, well, yeah, I'm going to invest and it's a good tax write-off for me. I think I can make some money, but it'll help you as well. And I think that would be a good lie, you know, like he's, yeah. uh, honestly, I'm going to get something out of it, but you're going to get something out of it too. So what's the harm? Yeah. But then immediately he just tries to bribe her. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That, that doesn't work immediately. So he just pulls out a 50 pound note and says, how much do you want? And, you know, fair enough. They're working with a pretty limited time thing here. They've got mm. to kind of just take what they can. Uh, but yeah, so uh, ultimately uh, the, the comedy of this scene is that some other people turn up. And so he has to pretend that he's not a Tory MP in, in Hackney. And how does he do that, Alan? How how does how does he how does he pretend to be uh, you know working class? He puts on a, a a parka and a balaclava and does a northern accent. There won't be a full scale communist revolution with middle class blood flowing in the gutters until the palliative reforms of the Attlee era are swept aside and the masses have to face the stark reality of their historic class conflict vis a vis the ruling bloody elite. I really like this because he goes over the top, left in it up, left winging it up. This gives him the space to say the unsayable on the other side and be even more radical than these left wingers are. Yeah, which is really nice, actually. I wish we got more of mm. this. 
It was in, great. Because this is written by people who lean to the left. It's pretty clear that it's satirizing right-wing politics and the Conservative <laughs> Party. But it's very good for the sake of balance, but also just for the sake of self-reflection to look at yourself yeah uh, and and so yeah. we get that here and it's a pretty rare in the show to be honest but yes we the couple that come in as georgina's housemates kind of white guilt middle class socialists and mm -hmm. alan sort of sniffs them out <laughs> without immediately <laughs> without particularly trying kind of sort of exposes their uh, hypocritical nature somewhat and we, we don't get much of an ex exploration of that which would, which would be nice but we just get a couple of gags out of mm. it you know in the immediate sense, he is exposed quite quickly because yeah. uh, he uh, his car gets broken into and he, re he responds. But also, Georgina is exposed as a turncoat because yes. you know she's she's he's obviously in her flat. Yeah, they make a very poor fist of trying to get out of it. <laughs> they don't. They're not very good at coming up with an excuse on their feet. Well. Alan doesn't care, but she's not very good at, uh, at coming up with a good excuse. Uh, and yeah, again, just showing his sort of psychopathic nature, Alan just immediately moves on to the next guy who's going to be leader. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, oh, you're leader, are you? How much do you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, and this, so this sets up the next part of the plot, which is, you know, Alan says, well, well, we'll take Hackney, you know, we'll win Hackney. And the guy says, the Tories will never win Hackney. We're the poorest borough in Britain. We got 57% unemployment. And it's almost said with pride, like, like you say, these little middle class, this poverty self-flagellation. Like it's not, it's not top Trumps, mate. Seven percent unemployment, and he says the only way you could win Hackney is if you could take the vote away from the working class. Boom. Ooh, good. Idea. And we move on. <laughs> The, the, so the next scene, we're in the House of Commons, we're in the chamber of the House of Commons. I think this is a good point to talk about the fact this was all filmed in Leeds. This is Yorkshire television. Yes. I know that in Leeds they had, I don't know if they still have, a complete replica of the House of Commons. And it was used for a lot of well, things. Actually, it wasn't in Leeds. I thought it was in Leeds as well, but I think... Oh, really? I think I thought that because of New Statesman. And I knew that was filmed in Leeds. And so I thought, oh yeah, connection that. It was actually was it? in, it was in Manchester at Granada Studios. You're joking. Yeah. I thought this was a great, I'm, I'm Yorkshire Pride, you're just <laughs> knocking down here. <laughs> Bloody Manchester. <laughs> Bloody Lancashire. Yeah, it was in Granada Studios at Manchester and it was originally built uh, for a drama series called First Among Equals in the 80s. That rings a bell. Who was in that? Well, it rings a bell because it's based on the novel written by Geoffrey Archer. Ah, okay. It was built for that originally. And then, you know, anybody who needed to use the uh, House of Commons set would use that. And yeah. it was even used uh, as recently as 2011 uh, for the Iron Lady with Meryl Streep. The, that right. was used for yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's all in storage now. It, it wasn't used enough to keep it up. It was like obviously quite, ex shit. quite expansive. Uh, but it still yeah. exists in some form, I think. I think. I don't think it's been just trashed and that's all we have time for this week but do return next time where we'll be continuing our journey with new statesmen we'll have a little bit more politics and we will be diving into the career of Marx and Goran in much more detail. Do come back for that. In the meantime, you can visit us on our social media at BritcomPod on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you very much for listening and we will see you next time. <laughs>